Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's the first time I'm going to give the, this uh, talk, so please be indulgent uh, with me. So for people who, who don't know Reminder, what we are doing at Reminder is trying to reinvent talent assessment and uh, sourcing by using artificial intelligence and deep learning. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, when we talk about deep learning and machine learning, we know that it's an area that is right now uh, completely uh, exploding. And actually, there is a two big risk uh, with uh, this area. So the first one is with adversarial examples, and the second uh, big risk is with biases that the system can capture on the training time. So for the first uh, one which is the adversarial real examples, some hackers can use them to get into your system or to compromise this, your system. So uh, this kind of hack can be done in purpose. And the second one uh, is done without uh, purpose because it can capture the, the biases from the data. As an example of adversarial example, uh, here, uh, for example, by changing on the first image, image uh, just some pixels, we can trick, can see that we can trick the algorithm. So um, he cannot uh, be able to segment, for example, the image and detect that there is some pedestrian, for example, in the image, which is, can be uh, very bad in, in the case of a self-driving car uh, uh, that, that could hurt those people. And the second example uh, shows you how by adding some noise to a picture, we can completely change and trick the system. Show, so we change the category, the original category uh, of the, the image. So our talk today will be about uh, biases, which is, uh, as we can see last year, has been raising uh, in the media. So maybe everyone here knows about the example of the Google Gorilla, uh, which uh, classified a black uh, American woman uh, as uh, a gorilla, uh, unfortunately. So this is another example of biases uh, also on Google sentiment analysis. So Google uh, gives a very negative uh, sentiment for words like I'm black or phrase like I'm a black while giving um, very good um, positive sentiment for words like white power. So this is a really new research area emerging last year uh, with the fact that those systems are right now uh, used in hundreds of thousands or millions uh, of systems going from our phones to the devices that we can use at home and the cloud, uh, etc. So the, it's also raising the public awareness. So for, for example, the, um, we have a quote from Mustafa Suleiman, who is the co-founder of DeepMind, who says that uh, we can hurt billions uh, of peoples during a short period of time. So to give you a little bit of history about the word bias and what it, does it mean exactly. So the word bias appears for the first time on the, in the 14th century. So it was in geometry exactly, and it was referring to an oblique or a diagonal uh, line. And it, we had to wait until the 16th century to get uh, a similar um, definition like that we have today as an undue prejudice. And on the 19th century, we had the de actual definition of bias in statistics, which is the systematic difference between a sample and a population. So what does bias mean exactly in terms of machine learning? In machine learning, we know that we can, uh, a good visualization of uh, biases is often about underfitting, which is a case where the system is have has a high bias and the low variance in constructs with the situation of overfitting where you have higher variance by very low um, uh, bias, bias and where the system is uh, not only capturing the data but also the noise. So from the legal point of view, uh, bias means uh, exactly the judgment based on preconceived prejudices, 
And this is very hard to fix uh, in the systems uh, in general, uh, even with techniques like model validation. So this means uh, that we can have a system that is biased from the perspective, the low legal perspective, and uh, it's not biased from the machine learning perspectives. And most of the time, those kind of biases are from the data we are training uh, on because we can only train on the data that we have on the real life, which can be uh, either incomplete or skewed or non-representative. So this is an example uh, of a game where we, some many people were asked to draw uh, some truths, and most of people draw uh, a true like the one on the left-hand side, and by training on the data, the system uh, w wasn't able to detect the truths on the right-hand uh, side. Another example of uh, bias is the latent bias. For example, if you try to train a classifier on images of scientists on the internet, you will end up with more uh, men, of course, than women. Another example of bias is the selection bias. It's when you try to train on data which is not really representative. Uh, for example, if you try to, um, to crawl the internet uh, and to extract some images and train some, let's say, face recognition image, you will end up with, uh, I, I think that the most popular one is, the, is George Bush. Uh, on, the, on, on the internet. So it's not really representative of all the population. So uh, according to Kate Crawford, um, uh, which I think she's a researcher at Microsoft, um, that there, there is two kinds of harms with biases. The first one is the harm of allocation, uh, which depends on the task. For example, if I want to uh, to give a loan to, to someone, uh, there can be uh, some biases. And the second uh, category of biases are the representation biases, which are uh, more difficult to uh, interpret or to detect. Uh, for example, one of the common biases we can see in the recruitment, uh, and this is something that we noticed at reminder, it's when the recruiter is screening uh, resumes. So based, um, most of candidates think that by putting a lot of colors on their uh, resumes, they may uh, influence the, 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 the decision uh, of the recruiter. And we found out that people with more uh, colors in their resumes are less, uh, have less likelihood to be uh, choose, chosen for the interview because it's simple for the recruiter to go through uh, a one column uh, and simple uh, resume. You have, uh, for example, some uh, biases with languages. If the recruiter is more comfortable with English than in French and ha has uh, many uh, hundreds or thousands of resumes, he will end up with more resumes in the lang language where he or she is more comfortable. Uh, you can also have some gender uh, classical stereotyping. And uh, for the embedding, I'm going to show it to you uh, after in the presentation. So what we are doing exactly at uh, Reminder is trying to make recruitment free of biases and uh, stereotypes. And if you look to the recruitment uh, today, this is a good picture of what is happening. So recruiting is basically based on keyword searches and biased criteria, such as well-known schools or well-known uh, companies. And the problem with those keywords is that not only they are not able to translate the diverse set of experiences and backgrounds of the candidates, but it will also um, push the recruiter to miss high potential candidates, and it's going to favor prestige and not the real potential of the candidates. So, for example, today, if you are a recruiter and you are posting a job offer on the internet, you will have to deal with three major concerns. So the first one, it's the globalization one. So recruiting is getting more and more global and applicants uh, can pop up from all around the world. And it will be very hard for a recruiter, let's say, based in France to assess someone applying from uh, Singapore. And it will be also very hard for a recruiter based in the US to assess someone 
coming uh, from France. And this is very crucial because the world is getting more open and connected. And this is an issue for, let's say, multinational companies, but also startups. For example, in our case, at Reminder, we are receiving, uh, there is um, a job which is very important for us. It's a data scientist one. And we are ready to bring talent from all over the world because it's crucial for our business. The second problem that the recruiter will have to deal with is the variety of professional backgrounds. So he, have, he has to keep up with this variety and uh, with the fact that today we have an increasing gap between education and between the job market. And the third thing the recruiter has to deal with is the fast evolution of the job market. And uh, with the fact that more than 60% of the jobs that we will need in the next two decades that don't exist yet, so we have to uh, favor a more transversal approaches. So those two problems can be increased with the amount of application that can be received by uh, a company. In the case of company Ranchat that we are working with, they, uh, on the beginning of the let's say 2000, uh, of 2000, they were receiving uh, application by post letters and they were publishing job offers on the newspaper and they went from there to receiving more than 80 million resume each year. They select 2 million people and every day they are placing more than 600 people. So how to deal with this large amount of application. So what we do exactly at Reminder is that we developed a technology able to extract and analyze all the career paths of the candidates. And what I mean is exactly about career paths, it's, it's each element of the resume, which is experiences, backgrounds, transition. So basically uh, every uh, thing. So we developed a general framework that allows us today to deal with for the very first time with all kinds of jobs uh, going from the technical one, but also for the very first time the non-technical one and the less qualified one. And to, to give you a concrete example about it, uh, for example, today if you take someone working in restoration and someone working as an event manager, from the perspective of a keyword system, it will be two different jobs. But since our system takes also into consideration the transition between jobs, is, the system is able to figure out that between those two positions, you have some hidden correlations, such as the fact that you have to be highly organized and able to perform well under pressure. The second thing well, that we are going to take into consideration is the multilingual aspect. Today, if I have a resume, if I apply with Eng my English resume or my French resume, since I'm the same person, I have I must have the same opportunity and the same, which is not uh, the case in the real life. Also, having a multilingual uh, technology, it allows us to benefit from the data from other markets. So by looking to the market, we saw that there is some countries more advanced in certain type of jobs. For example, if you take the US, they are more invested in marketing. Uh, in Europe, in general, we are very good in science. If you take, for example, Japan, they are very, very good uh, in semiconductors, uh, th those kind of jobs. So by also training on a multilingual, uh, uh, training a multilingual system, it allows you to get data from different horizon and be able to transfer it to the local market of the recruiter and be always in the future of the recruiter. Another thing that is also uh, very uh, uh, important in recruitment in general, is that uh, actually the most of biases are very, very local. So when you train over a very, very broad data, what you are going to do is averaging all the local biases so the system will really concentrate on what makes people good across backgrounds, countries, etc. And finally, the technology is multilingual. So how we do that exactly? The technology is built on three artificial intelligence layer. So the first one is a structuring uh, layer based on deep computer vision and deep natural language processing. It allows us to structure the data, but also delete the bias, the color bias that I talked about uh, a few slides ago. 
Then we use external data, both for representation and to print, train our model. And finally, we use some custom data from the company in order to retrain our model and to fit their specific needs in terms of culture and requirement. So this is, uh, so I'm going to go through a, a specific example of biases, which is um, stereotyping, uh, gender stereotyping, and I'm going to show how we can solve uh, this uh, bias both from uh, a task perspective and a representation perspective. So here we have um, a definition of statistical um, uh, parity, and basically what this uh, formula is saying, it's formalizing a way, uh, for example, that if someone uh, belongs to a subset uh, S, let's say, from a very uh, global community, the income uh, of the classifier that you are using either for giving loans or for recruiting, uh, it's, it should not change the, the income. And on the second one, we are showing it's the same it's statistical parity, but at the level of two different individuals. For example, if we define, let's say, a metric and uh, two people are close from each other in the term of this metric, the classifier should give them the same, let's say, uh, uh, income. This is two other definitions. So the first one is about equality of opportunity. Uh, and what this say exactly is that, for example, if you are qualified for a job and you are belonging to, let's say, a subgroup or a community so that the income should not change. And the last one, what is saying exactly is that if, for example, the algorithm on the training time favor a certain type of population, it's must be true in real life. So this was for, uh, and, and there is many, many uh, kind of formula like that uh, that you can find uh, on the internet. And um, here there is an article published uh, on 2016 uh, which shows that sh uh, all those uh, different uh, formula or condition of fairness cannot be satisfied uh, at the same time. So if you are curious, you can go and check uh, this uh, article. The second type of um, bias, it's type of bias on the representation. And I'm going to give an example about word embedding, which is very uh, popular and used uh, in natural language pro processing. So word embedding has this very nice property of linear property. For example, if I take the, the vector of man minus woman, it will be equal to the vector of king minus queen, which means uh, that men are to women what king are uh, to queen, which is very uh, nice property. And actually, when we take a closer look to the data set and we look to, for example, the vector he minus the vector uh, she, I think that it's uh, inverted, so it's uh, inverted it on the, 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 the slide, uh, but it's still bi biased, so we, we can see that there is many type of biases that the system is uh, incorporating, like uh, women uh, should be homemaker, and man should be maestro or computer uh, programmer, and um, actually when we try to, to let's say, to, to look to all those different kinds of biases, we can uh, construct many uh, pairwise, uh, many pairs of biases here. So some of them are gender stereotypes, but some of them are appropriate, uh, like queen, king is appropriate, uh, father, mo mother are appropriate, but uh, designer, act architect are not appropriate. And there is uh, actually um, a paper from 2016, which is a very uh, recent, that uh, shows and demonstrates how we can devise this word embedding. So the first step to do is to, um, to take all different uh, pairs uh, of vectors, which are equal to the male minus uh, female. So they are not exactly equal, so you can construct uh, a matrix 
of those uh, vectors, which represent the gender stereotype. And then what we are going to do, you just have to take the single value decomposition of this mat matrix to capture the subspace uh, of uh, gender uh, stereotyping. And most of the time since the the distribution of the value um, decomposition is very, very skewed. You can take only, the, for example, the, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, vector. And there is two ways to solve this problem. For example, uh, one way is it's a hard bias cor correction. And what you can do is just by taking the vector of words, subtract the vector of the words in the subspace that we find with the single value decomposition and update it. And another way to do it is a soft bias correction by minimizing the quantity that you can say. So the first, uh, the first term of this equation, um, in this first term of equation, what you want to do is to conserve the, you want to find the subspace with a, a, trans, a linear transformation where you can um, con, you, you, you can have the same uh, inner product. And for the second term, what you want to do is you want that your new space is orthogonal to the biased uh, space. And by doing that, they managed both to reduce um, gender stereotyping in the representation while having the same um, accuracy. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Wadin. Very interesting. Come, come there. Okay. Any question from the uh, from the audience? Was quite technical at the end. So, uh, any technical question, if you want, or more general question on the uh, on the on the bias yeah, over there, Alex. Just one minute, so you can speak in the microphone. Um, so I just wanted to come back on the word embeddings at the end. Uh, you said, I, I think in order to have an efficient one embedding matrix, you have to have words which come, very, come back very often in your data. Otherwise, I guess um, rare words or out of vocabulary words even might not be uh, very well um, represented in, in your matrix. Uh, given we will have jobs which will change in the near future, maybe new words, maybe new, uh, new competencies as well, new new tasks, uh, how do you plan to update your models with new words? Okay, so there is actually two, two parts of the question. So the first uh, question was about the co-occurrence in the word embedding. Actually, the, the word embedding are able to go beyond uh, only the co-occurrence. For example, if you take uh, in the, uh, for example, in most of corp corpora or most of corpus, the number of co-occurrence of male nurse is much higher than female nurse in general we so they, they they we we say nurse and we say male nurse um, it's very um, um, it's less um, you, you don't have that much uh, co-occurrence of male nurse and this and with that the system will able to to figure out that um, nurse it's more uh, um, related to female in the uh, gender stereotyping of the cor corpus than uh, male. So it's not exactly about only uh, co-occurrence. And the second question is about how we can update our models. Actually, um, so today we have a platform where different recruiters or companies, they can plug their database of candidates and they can uh, assess them. And we take uh, two things into consideration to update our model. So the first thing, it's the, the feedbacks uh, that uh, the, the recruiters are putting into our uh, platform. So uh, we have pre-training, shared training, and some uh, custom training. And the second uh, thing, it's about the data that people can um, can input into our platform, and we know that those kind of algorithms, like word embedding, they can be incremental, so you you can update them very very fast. Just to complement the question, to, so for example, you're looking also at all the job positions listed on job board and so on to educate your model, just to see if there's new jobs, new, uh, you know. Uh, 
Actually, I, I think that jobs in general, they, they are a fake uh, representation of the reality because recruiters, most of the time, they are looking f into people. And that's why we base all our learning on the data from the people in the, in the real life. I can give you a very, uh, an, an example. For example, in my gap year, there is Societe Generale who published an offer and they asked people to be expert in VBA. So I didn't apply it because I didn't consider myself at that time as an expert uh, in VBI. And I have a friend of mine who applied for this position and uh, get that job. And after changing his status on LinkedIn, I asked him, did, was he really qualified uh, as an expert of VBI? And he said, me, uh, no. So there is a huge gap between what companies are seeking for and the reality. Another question there. Uh, in one of your slides, uh, you have some Im images with... Uh, 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 div uh, with some modifications which were not rec recognizable by uh, computers. Did you try to do the same for your model? For example, just input uh, a new resume and uh, just change a lot of things in it and uh, try to find uh, how many things change the result or the output? Yes. Um. So actually, right now, most of, of the, the, the test that has been done on adversary example, it was on images uh, most of the time because they are, um, I think, easier to, to trick. And on text, it, they are, it's harder uh, to do. And, uh, when, and even when, because in our system, we have a hierarchical representation of words, of paragraph, of resumes. So you have to trick uh, each. Uh, which is uh, harder to do. But this is something that we are working on. Okay, last, last question, Alex. Just one, and then we're moving on. Uh, I have a rather business question here, not technical one. Uh, so how do you convince the clients to buy uh, your products and the users? Are they recruiters? And um, are your clients uh, mostly large corporations who already use um, this kind of software, and you add uh, the unbiased intelligence to it. Um, okay. So, so how was they be convinced that they will give their uh, so very so human selection okay. to... So basically, uh, the question is about who are our user and what is our value proposition. Um, uh, so our user are recruiters, managers, uh, staffing companies, corporate companies. Uh, we, we work with all sides of companies. And... Um, so they can either uh, plug the database to, to assess them, or they can uh, get access to some uh, database of resumes in our marketplace that some other people shared, like schools or job fairs, uh, etc. And for the assessment part, we have two uh, principal value propositions. So the first is allowing recruiters to identify up to four times more relevant talents, uh, because we can deal with volume, we can identify some uncommon um, let's say application um, and uh, the second one it will be helping the recruiters to shorten the time to fill a position by two or by three okay we did thank you very much it was very interesting thanks again <laughs>